So one of the things that is also at the the base of this um, terrible phenomena, which is still an enormous problem in our culture, is the impulse to literalize things that are fantasies and symbolic. Right. Jung has said, and I wish I could find this quote because I know I'm paraphrasing it, but um, he was talking about containment and or writing about it, and he said that it's the devil that makes you want to think it's literal. Oh, that's Maria Louise von Franz. Oh, it's von Franz. Thank you I, so I much. Can, oh, I can get that. Yes, I'd love to have that yeah, quote. Yeah, I, I can get correctly. that correctly. And there is something to that, that um, there is there is a way in which our senses can just be trapped into a materialistic perspective. So whatever my eyes see, well, that must be the fact. So, I mean, that's what fuels this thing about flat earth theory, that my eyes tell me that the horizon is flat, and so therefore the earth must be flat. So when we begin to extend that into mystical texts like the Bible or, or other mystical texts, and we take everything as literal in a materialistic way, it alienates us from reality, it alienates us from consequences as well, terrible consequences that are done in the name of literalized fantasy material. And so as psychoanalysts, we're very interested in people's fantasies, but we call them fantasies. These are products of the unconscious, and they are full of meaning, and they are more meaningful when they are looked at symbolically. That's beautifully said, Joseph. And I and I think it's like you're saying, like this this fantasy material is important. We should we should treat it as if it's important, but not treat it as if it's literal and concrete. And this this is the great like literalism is the great sin of modernity, really. And it you know it's like Deb, you said what seeds us, and I want to say, well, I think it's normal. I think we're always doing this, and 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 the problem is. I think we've diagnosed it, Joseph, with what you said that it's it's a it's a problem of of being of being too concrete, and and that quote, or at least one of them, is Marie Louise von Braun says, "The devil is the one who wants the concrete thing." Great, thank he you says, so much. <laughs> yeah, he says something which has no existence in concrete reality is not real. So, um, but it, but I want to say, you know, it goes back to that quote from Jung. Where, where he says, you know, we think we've gotten rid of our prejudices and our, and our uh, you know, being superstitious by, by not believing in, in the gods anymore. But instead, in fact, they've just, they've actually gotten more concrete and that creates a problem. So if we could relate to any of this stuff as, as fantasy material, as you're saying, Joseph, then we wouldn't we wouldn't be caught in this. So I, I think that is a big part of it is a, the a lack of ability to think symbolically or psychologically and to 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 take these things as literal, and to also take our feelings as a, a given. If I feel something this strongly, then it must be real. Yes. And I think that gives rise to all kinds of things about, you know, at that point during the, what was then termed the satanic panic, you know, people were saying, you have to believe the children. Yes. Who are, of course, highly suggestible. They're, the interview techniques were nowhere near as well developed as they have been since. Uh, so, uh, you know, children were, in a sense, kind of coerced. Uh, to let loose their imaginations and strong feelings. And that was, quote, evidence, unquote, of then it must be real. And we have a number of societal issues going on now uh, around abuse uh, and women. And do we simply believe? How do we take it seriously? How do we take these things into consideration? Um, and how do we do uh, our our own conscientious sort of investigation, not to mention fact checking? Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's this idea that I think is kind of relevant here. It's this idea 
called Fairy Tale Science. No, I'm sorry, Tooth Fairy Science. And it's an idea that was posited by the Dr. Harriet Hall. I love this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very cool. And it's where you, st it's, it's studies that investigate something that is unfalsifiable. So you, you can gather up a lot of, let, let me, um, let me just read you some quotes from Hall because I, I think it'll, I think it's kind of relevant to what you're saying. So she says, tooth fairy scientists mistakenly think that if they have collected data that is consistent with their hypothesis, then they have collected data that confirms their hypothesis. So you could measure how much money the tooth fairy leaves under the pillow, whether she leaves more cash for the first or last tooth, whether the payoff is greater if you leave the tooth in a plastic baggie versus wrapped in Kleenex. You can get all kinds of good data that is reproducible and statistically significant. Yes, you have learned something, but you haven't learned what you think you've learned because you haven't bothered to establish whether the tooth fairy really exists. And it seems to me that something like that was at play in this, where you're, you're, you've got this book, Michelle Remembers. You take it as fact, and then you start designing public programs to train people how to ferret out this abuse or how to respond to it. You, you sort of, it begs the question, you just made an assumption. And this happened at the very highest levels. I mean, Janet Reno was involved in prosecuting one of these cases. So, you know, the, 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 the penetration of this belief was extraordinary, and it never passed the common sense test. But what um, you're also talking about here is how powerful confirmation bias is. Yes. You know that if, if I see that, leaving a tooth under the pillow uh, results in payment, and payment is higher for molars than it is. <laughs> uh, the natural conclusion is definitely uh, the tooth fairy must exist. And, and I check with my friends, and the tooth fairy comes for them too. Um, therefore, it's real. And, and Janet Reno was a member of the Supreme Court, by the way. That's how how high up the judiciary ladder, so to speak, this went. But that we cherry pick things that fit our internal theory, our bias, our wish to believe something, and then the facts fit in and support uh, something that really is not objectively real. She was the attorney general. She wasn't ah, part of the thank Supreme you. Court. Yeah. Okay. I had to look that up to be sure, but yes. Yes. Um, absolutely. We, we're, we're, we, we start with the assumption and then we proceed from there rather than, than really kind of doing, doing our due diligence. But we're all susceptible to this. But that in itself is so fascinating that we start with assumptions. We start with an assumption that there are these uh, satanic, uh, predatory cults, little groups that do these things. We start with that. And that's really a hell of an assumption. <laughs> it is. Isn't it? That the people that are running your child's daycare center are uh, practicing satanic rituals on preschool children. That is an amazing assumption to even consider, m much less expand on and, and believe. And it's frightening. I think, I think that's also what, what we need to really hold. I mean, in, in a smaller way, we're seeing that again with cancel culture, is that um, false aspersions, the devil who throws accusations, constellates in the collective, and then strange things are done, and your, your wife posts something on Facebook, and then you lose your job as a corporate CEO, which by the way happened. I mean, it's, it's bizarre to see this, the incredible, dangerous horror that happens around 
the constellation of the of the devil as the accuser and it destroyed people's lives i found out only recently that in the small town of edenton where i have my weekend place that that there was a major satanic panic trial um i i have not had it in me to ask anyone local about this because it must have been horrific but uh it was called the little rascals daycare center which apparently was really infamous so in 1989 a bunch of these kind of religious leaders became obsessed with the daycare center and they uh, charged um, Bob and Betsy Kelly and a bunch of other minimum wage workers with in, that's incredible um, things of, of killing babies, um, which of course they never, never, they never found, found a them. Dead like baby. none of the parents never lost a baby. It. Right. They all picked them up at day school, right. but somewhere there are the bodies of babies that aren't being revealed and children being taken out. Onto the onto the ocean in boats and subjected to things, you know, while you're at work um, and coming back, and then all kinds of strange, grotesque ceremonies, and then of course um, horrific sexual fantasies are projected onto this. And so the accusations start; it catches on fire. The investigations come in, and particularly the children who are coached and coaxed by asking very specific, fantastical questions. I mean, have you ever seen this holding up a pentagram? And did anybody ever do this to you? I mean, kids are very impressionable. Mm -hmm. And also they can feel the incredible fear. Well, and they want to, and they want to please, right? So of course they it's do. like, oh, you know, the, the investigator gets excited when the kid says, oh, yes. And so the kid keeps going, you know. Yeah, and one of the adult uh, adults who was a child uh, and was interrogated said he lied because it was the only way he could get away from the questioning, that he, he, he wasn't going to be allowed to leave unless he said what his interrogators wanted him to say. 